That's Brother Matt Waterhouse, and he is uh, one of our new staff members, teaches Bible out the college as well as some music classes. And beautiful rendition. No one ever cared for me like Jesus, and that was written by a man who's one day he was an evangelist, and he had um, um, gone out to preach and came home, and his wife left him a note and said, I do not want to be married to an evangelist. I can't do this anymore. And she left him never to come back. And he was very lonely and very discouraged, but he did play the piano, and he did sing, and he did write that song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. Uh, he was a man that Brother Hiles, whenever he, Brother Lee Robertson had him come, and I'm, I'm, the name escapes me. Does someone know who I'm talking about? Yeah, Charles Weigel. And uh, Brother, Brother Hiles went to go to see him. He was down at Tennessee Temple University, and Brother, uh, Brother Robertson, Robertson had him have a place that, on campus, and he would teach young people and minister to them in his senior years. And Brother Hiles wanted to go see him, and he went over to there, and he was up he heard all kinds of commotion going on in his room, he jumping around and noise, and he thought, and he heard him t talking and laughing, and thought, man, there's a party going on in here, and he knocked on the door, and finally he came out there, and, and uh, Brother Weigel came out, and he was up in his 80s or maybe 90s at that time, and he was just getting happy with Jesus in there, just him and Jesus, and he was praising the Lord, and he had Brother Hiles come in. It's just a wonderful, sweet story, but no one ever cared for me like Jesus, and what a great truth that song is. Before we get to our message tonight on soul winning with Jesus and, and uh, this passage of Scripture in John chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 5, and uh, your worksheet is on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. And a little bit of uh, outline there, we're glad to, not an outline, but maybe some thoughts and lessons we can learn. Last night, and Linda and I were over in Monday and Tuesday night over in Chesapeake, Virginia at the Grace Baptist Temple, pastored by Brother Matt Nettesheim. And uh, Brother Matt was 19 years old, and he was looking for something to do on a Saturday at the Great Lakes Naval Station. And uh, this is years ago in 1999. He was 19 years old. And there, um, two men approached him and said, we got a bus going to Hammond. Would you like to go with us? We're going to play some football. And and get a good meal, and we have church tomorrow. And he said, yeah, I think I will go. Boy, that night, uh, Brother Hooker preached the gospel of Christ on that Saturday night. He accepted the Lord as his Savior. And then got, uh, just was here just about, about six months, went to church every service, started bringing his car down and driving in his own car, and then went out to San Diego, and then was stationed there in Norfolk, Virginia. And he started going to one of our graduates' church there and was there for a while. And then five years ago, 14 people called him to be the pastor of the Grace Baptist Temple. And uh, they asked him to come be their pastor. And he, had, he, he, he owned a little laundromat and a little roofing business to trying to make ends meet. And he now has 10 children. Uh, he married a young lady that, uh, whose husband passed away in a car accident with three children. And they've had seven more since that time. Uh, God would be a nut to have that many kids. I tell you what. Nine's okay, but ten, that's over the top. Nonetheless, uh, uh, that, that church is just packed and jammed, and, and they're having two services every Sunday. And Sunday night, they have a groundbreaking service. They're going to build a brand-new 300-seat auditorium and two-story. Two um, and the, the church is paid off, and they're getting ready to— they, they're going to have to borrow a little bit of money to get it done, but it is a beautiful, beautiful church family. Unbelievable. You'd be so pleased to walk in. You could sense the unity, soul-winning, just pureness— uh, purity that was there, just wonderful. Never got to go to a day of Hiles Anderson College. Only been here a few times, uh, maybe one or twice since he, since he got out of the Navy. And yet uh, he really learned so much from this place and from those who had been influenced by this place. And now uh, hundreds of people attend there at that church. And just a really exciting thing. Thank you for what you do for the Lord and for all those who have worked in the military ministry in the Great Lakes. You pray that we can get that started again. We need to do that for those young men like him that God could use in a special way. John chapter 5, the Bible says in verse number 1, And after, these, after, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and the, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, Bethesda which means a mercy house, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind and halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. 
For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole in whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there which um, had infirmity thirty and eight years. For thirty and eight years he had been crippled. And when Jesus saw him lie, uh, he uh, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me in the pool. And while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and he took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said unto him uh, that was cured, it is a Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed, what's not who he was? I, I don't know. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And afterward, Jesus findeth, findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art, thou, art made, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee, come unto thee. And the man departed and, and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Heavenly Father, bless in the next few moments as we make some observations from this wonderful experience that your son did on this earth there at the pool of Bethesda. Thank you for the church family, and thank you for the wonderful, wonderful people that assemble here on a Wednesday night. Bless the kids as they're taught the Word of God as well, and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you had a, several weeks ago, Brother Woosley, in my absence, spoke on this topic, and I was so glad to hear about that, the, the healing of the man of Bethesda. This is a unique thing because it's very kind of unexplainable but the, to me, but the pool of Bethesda was a house of mercy, a merciful house where people who had illnesses and problems and disease and crippled and, and all kinds of ailments would come and would sit around these five porches, around these pools, hoping for the moving, a supernatural moving of the angel of God who would move and move them on the waters. And whenever the waters moved, the first person who would get into the water could be healed. It was a very special thing, a very unique thing, probably something we don't have today, but they did have it there, and God gave a place for hurting people to go. Well, the Lord Jesus, of course, he had already been to Samaria and back up to Galilee, and he had healed the, healed the nobleman's son, and he had been up to Galilee. Now, of course, the book of John is a map of him going up and down from Galilee down to Jerusalem for the feast, and then back up, and now he's come down to Jerusalem. And he and the, the 12 disciples appear at the pool of Bethesda. And there, there are many sick people, but Jesus went to one. I don't exactly know why that's the case. There were lots of people that he could have healed, and there are some circumstances where he healed many people hour after hour, moment after moment. They, they brought lots and hundreds of people, no doubt, to him to heal in the day's time. But here he comes, and he sees one man who has obviously been there an awful long time. And he just asked him a question. He said, Wilt thou be made whole? And the man said, look, if I, if I just had some, I want to be whole, but I have no man. When the water's troubled to help me get into the water quick. While I'm trying to crawl over the water, another person goes in front of me and he gets in there before I do. It's been a long, hard journey. It's a long time, 38 years he's been sick like this and crippled. Well, then, of course, uh, the Lord Jesus said, would you be whole? And he said, okay, you know, I would, but I have no man. He said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And he took up his bed, and, and he took up and rolled up his, his sleeping bag or his cot or whatever he has there, and he starts carrying it home. 
And Jesus conveyed himself away. He didn't identify who he was. And, and uh, it was a crowded place with a lot of sick people. And he just had a, to, to my knowledge, had a conversation with one of those many people who needed help. But he spoke to him and then he conveyed himself away, the Bible says, so that other people did not come to him for healing. But he told him, wrap up your bed, take your bed and walk. And on his way home, he's taking his bed and he's happy as he could be. He hadn't walked in 38 years. I'm sure he's skipping. I'm sure he's happy. I'm sure he's excited. And he's got the bed with him. And, and some Pharisees come up to him and they say, Hey, what are you doing carrying your bed? It's the Sabbath day. Sun's not down. You don't need to be working on the Sabbath day. So all I can tell you, the guy, I haven't walked in 38 years. And the guy that told me and healed me, he told me to carry my bed, so I'm carrying my bed. He said, well, who was it who did that to you? They wanted to answer. Who was it who told you to carry your bed on the Sabbath day? Everybody knows we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. He said, I, I don't even know. All I know is I, I didn't walk, and now I can walk. He healed me, touched me. And boy, they got angry because he didn't know who it was. And then he managed to find his way back into the temple. I'm sure it's something, and oftentimes there was restrictions. People who were sick, people who were, who were maimed or halt or crippled, they would have to be outside the temple walls. You might remember in John chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter 3, where, where Peter and John went to pray and the man was crippled. He was outside of the gate called Beautiful. Because he couldn't go in. It was, it, was, it was part of the customs that if you were sick or you were maimed or halt, you, you weren't as welcome to go inside there. And, but now he takes his bed. I'm sure he takes it home. And he's going back. He's going to go into a place he hasn't gone in a long time. He's been crippled. He's been hampered. He can't even get around. He's been laying around hoping somebody would help him all these years. And he finds that, that Jesus is in the temple. And Jesus, the Bible says, he finds him. Didn't say he goes and finds Jesus. Jesus goes and finds him. Notice if you would please in verse number 14. And afterwards Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Go and sin, or sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And then he went and he told him, he, he went and found him and said, Listen, you, you're doing great. You're walking around. Now let's deal with your sin. Don't sin. Lest something worse comes to you. Deal with this. Confess your sins. Get right. I'm sure uh, those are the terms he was using. And then the, the, the guy immediately went and found the other guys who were accusing him of walking. He goes, hey, I know who it was to heal me. It was Jesus. He was happy to do it. And of course, that, but that provoked anger on behalf of the religious right. Because ever since Jesus said early on, he said, look, uh, Sabbath's not made for man, but man for the Sabbath. And I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, that really tore him up. Got him all fired up. Well, what can we learn from this lesson? It's a beautiful story. Lots of great truths in there. But what's the lessons that we can learn from this? I want to give you a few things when we talk about seeing Jesus and his encounters with unsaved people. How many have had already this week encounters with unsaved people? Would you raise your hand? Well, I have two. Linda and I were witnessing to a lady uh, yesterday, or on Monday, on the plane, and, and we tried to give the gospel to this precious lady, and she listened. She wanted to know, but she had a hard time. She, she, was, she wasn't ready to believe and receive the Lord, and she said, no, I'm not born again. I go to a certain church, a Methodist church, she told us, and she said, I believe that Jesus is wonderful, and he came and gave his life for what he believed in. And, uh, but she said, that virgin birth, that doesn't mean anything to me. What is that all about? And I explained to her why it was about it, because that ah, still doesn't really mean anything to me. I've got lots of uh, friends who are different faith and Jewish faith, and they're such good people. You're telling me they'll go to hell if they don't go through Jesus. Well, I said, I didn't tell you that. God did. I am the way, the truth, and life, because I even know that verse, he said, she said to me. I'm familiar with that verse. No man come to the Father but by me. And if there was another way, there'd be, that I would be glad to tell you, but there's not. And she said, boy, it's just hard to get my head around. I'm sorry, I really... I need to think about that. But what I tell you, it's wonderful. Give the gospel out. Give the gospel out. Let the Word of God do its work. And I'm convinced that Anne, uh, she still could be saved. And I believe God's doing something. He gave her a track to read over exactly what I just explained to her 
on the train, on the plane there. But all of us ought to be interacting. We're going to interact. God's put us in the world. He said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're in this thing, and you're in there to be a light and a salt and to be a way, uh, to a catalyst to bring people to the precious Lord Jesus Christ. With that in mind, here's a few things we can observe from this encounter with Jesus and this crippled man. Number one, hurting people can often be more receptive to the gospel message. People that are hurting can be often more receptive to the gospel message. And anyone who who has been a soul winner very long has noticed this. Something about a hurting heart that that, that causes them to be more receptive sometimes. Now, some people hurting people hurt people. But I have noticed this. I remember one time, and I just, I called her this afternoon, because I remember years ago, I was uh, at a homeless meeting. And there were lots of people there, but mostly men there, just a few ladies, and one young lady sat in the back left side, and she just cried through the entire time. At the end, it was an unusual service, and whenever I gave the invitation, numbers of people got up and wanted, we had more people wanting to be saved than we had people to share the gospel with them. And so I went back to Brother Gordon Miller, who was overseeing the service. I said, I'll help you talk to someone about Christ. And he said, would you help this lady? And I saw her, and I said, I would be glad to. She had a couple little kids down by her, by her feet, and, and, uh, and she was just weeping. I said, okay, her name was Letty. I said, Letty, could I just share with you the scriptures about how you can have eternal life? Because I want to know. I went through the gospel, and she prayed and trusted Jesus Christ, her Savior. She was sleeping in her van with her children. And uh, she, would, she had gone and, boy, sin had just taken. She had, she had had issues with drugs and alcohol and had to, had to even go away to go to a rehab ordered by the court. And a family in our church graciously took care of her three children. She was expecting her fourth child whenever I spoke with her. That precious little girl, she was hurting so bad. But she was so ready to receive the gospel of Christ. Today, she's a physician's assistant. Today, she has a beautiful home that she lives in with her family, and, and she just became a grandmother recently. And, and her kids and her family, and she would, if you went to First Baptist Church of Long Beach, you would see her with her family faithfully attending there Sunday morning, Sunday night, works in a, for a doctor that's done it for many years now, just doing a great job and serving the Lord, bringing other people to the Lord Jesus Christ oftentimes. But, you know, it came to a time when she was hurting. I think of Brother Mike Fish. I was listening to him. He was telling me, he said, he said Pastor, I was out soul winning one day, and I was so tired. He said, I, I, I didn't really want to go soul winning. I didn't really want to keep going. I was just weird. I worn out. And I looked, and there was a green house and a yellow house. And I said, Lord, I'm only going to do one of those houses. Tell me which one you want me to do, the yellow house or the green house. And, and he seemed, the Holy Spirit seemed to tell me, do the yellow house. So I said, okay, I went knock on that door. Knock on the door, a man came out. He said, uh, he said, uh, why are you knocking on my door? He said, I'm never here on a Saturday. He said, I'm divorced. I have my kids every other weekend. I go get my kids on the weekend. But last night, someone stole my Harley Davidson bicycle or, or motorcycle or, or my motorcycle. And I've been tore up about that thing. It's been driving me crazy. I'm staying, I'm staying here today trying to deal with what I'm going to do with that, that situation. I said, do you know why you're here on my porch? Why would you? I'm never here on Saturday. He said, well, the Bible says, and he went through the Scriptures, the man accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. What probably made him softer, though, is a hurt. He, he, he lost his motorcycle that was important to him. Difficult things happen. And the truth of the matter is, this makes us really have a great opportunity to witness a lot of people because a lot of people out there are hurting. I talked to a precious girl, and she's been coming here 17 weeks to church. And uh, someone has invited her, and, and she was in discipleship Sunday, and she just cried the whole time through discipleship Sunday. She said, she said, Pastor, she goes, I got to move. I don't want to move because this church has brought a smile on my face again. She said, my, her, my, my life is so hard. It's been such messed up. He said, I, I, you, the people, and she named several people in her church. She said, this church has done something that hasn't been done in a long time, put a smile on my face. 
And I've got to move back to, I think Inglewood is where she told me she had to move back. She goes, I don't, I'm going to come back here. I just don't know how soon I can come back. But boy, as I listened to her talk, I could tell there's a lot of pain in her life that brought her to the place. And she told me when she got saved, what God did to her heart. Hurting people can often be more receptive to hearing the gospel. Number, th number two, if you look there, the use of the right questions stimulate the heart and can open doors of opportunity to witness. Uh, the use of the right question. And what got this man stimulated was Jesus asked him a question. Wilt thou be made whole? He didn't walk up and say, if you die today, you know if you'd go to heaven. Nothing wrong with that question. It's one of the greatest questions I can ever ask somebody. But he said, don't you want to get fixed? Don't you want to be better? Don't you want to be able to walk? Maybe it was an odd question. But may I say to you, a good soul winner learns that good questions stimulate, stimulate the conscience. Accusations harden the will. You know, and, and good people who learn to witness to people and learn to work with people learn that a good question is very important. Jesus used a lot of questions, and this was not an isolated point. He said, wilt thou help? Because a good question oftentimes stimulates the heart and open doors of opportunity to witness. When you ask someone a question, most people appreciate that you're asking them something. Because all their life, they've been, people have been telling them something. You turn the news, they tell you something. You go to school, sit down, be quiet, listen to me. But when you start asking people something, oftentimes people are glad to be stimulated by that. It stimulates the heart and usually open up lots of questions or opportunities and it also gives you information to direct your, your um, Jesus said to the woman at the well, may I have a drink of water? He asked her a question. She came back pretty cocky. Why are you talking to me? You're a man. I'm a woman. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. He understood where she was coming from. But questions stimulate opportunities. And here he said, wilt thou be made whole? And these are things when you meet somebody. By the way, it help you learn someone's name if you will learn their name when you hear their name. When you hear their name, they say, my name is Jim. Say, Jim, let me ask you something. Where are you from, Jim? And say their name back to them. Now, they don't say it because they, they already know their name. You're saying it for your sake. So you can learn their name. But say it back to them and ask them a question using their name. And let them tell you where they're from. Where do you work? Is, are you married? Do you have kids? Whatever. Do you, whatever the question is. Do you do this gardening yourself, Jim? Whatever it might be. But oftentimes question and then lead into the question of salvation. I believe that's an important strategy. Number three. The lost soul will often seek help from another person. Try to be that person. Look at verses 7 and 8, would you please? The impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man that when the water is troubled to put me into the, into the pool. But while I am coming, another, man, another steppeth down before me. And of course, he, he was looking for some answers. And I, I think this is so, so beautiful. I was thinking about this, uh, a man that was giving me his testimony recently and what he, he found somebody that had some answers at work. It was another Christian. And he saw something different about them, their attitude, their dress, their, their response to problems. And now they're in a problem, and they start asking somebody to help them. Well, I want to be that person. I remember years ago when, a, when someone came and knocked on my door, a neighbor, and, and wanted, by the way, I have a friend, I have a, one of my neighbors there in, in Long Beach live next to me, and uh, Roy and Evelyn. And they, they came to our church a couple times, but they struggled with that because they knew we weren't going to move or they didn't think we were. <laughs> and, and neighbors are sometimes difficult when it comes to that because they, they, they know you. They don't think you're going to move. They're not going to move. And they're not sure they want, to, they want to respond to the gospel. They may not want to respond or go to the same church. There's a lot of things about us uh, as a Christians that, that make them nervous. But, but I, I will say this with Roy one time, he went to the hospital. And I, I'd witnessed him several times or tried to, and he listened and he was respectful. But one day he got hurt and he was in the hospital and I went to go see him. And I said, Roy, would you mind if I went over that gospel again? He goes, you know, I think it's a good time for me to do that. And Roy got saved in the hospital because he was hurting. He was more responsive. He had gone through a difficult trial. But I will say this, that, that when people... Uh, God uses people as a catalyst to get the gospel to people. 
And they're looking for somebody to help them, somebody with answers. And we don't want someone to give them a watchtower. That won't help them. Okay? We don't want to give them some Dr. Phil stuff or, or Oprah stuff or, or this person or that person. That's not necessarily going to help them. They, someone needs to tell them the truth. By the way, you can always help people if you open your heart to all, open your home when you're able, open your wallet when you're, when you're able to, and open your Bible for answers. Open your heart to everybody. Don't be prejudiced. Let, learn, to, learn to say, you know what, red, yellow, black, and white, rich, poor, doesn't matter. God put the poor and the rich together, and He's the maker of them all. So, I'm going to love everybody because God loves everybody. He's not a respecter of person. One of the things we know about God, not, so I don't want to be prejudiced. I am. You are. We always kind of size people up based upon how they appear and, and things of that nature. But that's not God's nature. He says, I am not a respecter of person. And open your home when you're able. By the way, I, I really think that we ought to be given to hospitality. Well, that's just for the pastor. I think that should be everybody. Well, if I have a big house, I'll do that. Well, if you won't do it with a studio, you won't do it with a mansion. Learn to use whatever God's given you. And it may not be a, your house, but it may be whatever God's given you in your, in your possessions. Use that for the furtherance of the gospel. And then... Open your wallet when you're able. You can't, you, using financial means, unrighteous mammon to win eternal friends, the Bible tells you. And then open your Bible for answers. Let that person be able to know. Go ask so-and-so. They'll know the answer to that. Be the Bible answer man, if you will. Number four, obedience and opposition follow the healing of the salvation here. As soon as the man got healed, he said, take up your bed and walk. Do you think he knew what day it was? He probably did. But he didn't really care because the man who had helped him, the Lord Jesus Christ, had told him to do it, and he was doing it. And, you know, whenever someone gets saved, obedience is usually one of those things. That's why I think when someone gets saved, I almost always speak to them immediately about baptism. Now, I've had some people tell me, no, no, pastor, you need to get them to church and then just point to the door and tell them to walk in. And then they'll just tell them to robe up, you know. And, and, and no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't want to get them to church and tell them about baptism. I like to tell them about it right away. Because if they truly get saved, there's something inside of them that will want to obey the Lord. Even if they don't understand it, at least I could tell them, you know what? One of the best things I want to tell you is I want to explain to you baptism. And some of them, oh, that's okay. I've already been baptized. And I may have to go there and talk to them because they were baptized in the infant and things of that nature. But I would just say this is what God wants you. You don't have to get baptized to go to heaven. Everything to go to heaven took place just a few moments ago when you believed and received Jesus Christ. But if we really believe and receive Christ, there is something inside of us that wants to obey Him. And they that gladly received His word were baptized. And it's something God wants us to do. I usually talk to them about because obedience usually follows salvation and then opposition follows salvation. The guys should have been so happy with him. They should have said, hey, what in the world? This is great. Instead, they, they give him a hard time because he's carrying a bed. He's carrying a roll. What are you doing? This is a Sabbath day. You can't be doing that. They didn't think about the fact that he'd been crippled for 38 years. Well, if you've ever been sowing very long and you've led people to Christ, you'll know that after someone gets saved, opposition almost immediately comes. There's a precious girl. She got saved. Her boss wants her to work on Sunday all of a sudden. She hasn't worked on Sunday for years. And all of a sudden now, the boss wants to work on Sunday. She's like, I don't know what's going on. You know, I'll tell you what's going on. Opposition's going on. I've seen people that they were, they were derelict on drugs and alcohol, and their families complain, trying to give them in rehabs, then they get saved, and they change radically. And then all of a sudden, a Jehovah Witness uncle wants to come put his arm around him and help him go to the kingdom hall. He never had aspiration to do it before. Now they're all excited about, hey, you, you got to come over to my church. you got to do this right here. And they get him in a, in, boy, the, why? Because the devil will fight. And after someone gets saved, that's why I just say to you, church family, you know this already, but helping people be discipled right after they get saved is so important. That time, that text, that follow-up visit, listen, don't just win them and leave them on the doorstep. I've been with soul winners, they lead someone to Christ and have no clue what the person's name is. 
didn't write down their address or their phone number or where they lived to follow up. They'd have no, no, indi- no effort to do that. I don't, I don't know about you, but that seems criminal to me. Just absolutely criminal to lead someone to the Lord and then just leave them and just say, I don't, I don't, I don't really care about them. Well, I think it's important we follow up with them. Just like a new mom, when she has a baby, God puts within her body a, a, a milk called colostrum. And that colostrum, even if a person is not going to nurse a child long term, the doctor wants the colostrum to get into the, the mouth of that little baby. Because that will give them antibodies to fight off initial infections that are going to naturally come. That will help make that baby strong early on in their life. Even if they're not going to long-term nurse, they want them to have that. And by the way, every soul winner ought to be concerned that your new convert gets immediate attention. Immediate injections of the Word of God and, and the milk of the Word right away. And sit down with them and say, now you're saved. Would you, would you, let me, let's work at it. You're going to have opposition, but you also should have some obedience there. Look at the next thing, if you would please. Verse number, or, or point number five. Care and follow-up are essential elements of effective soul winners. An effective soul winner. And basically here is just what Jesus did in verse 14. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and he said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, of worse thing come upon thee. Jesus sought him out. Care and follow-up is important. I've already kind of given my uh, thoughts on that situation. Verse number six, or, or not verse number six, but number six. New converts are often bold witnesses and ready to share their newfound faith in Christ with others. We have this example, and I don't know if our brother is here tonight, but there's a man who got saved back in December. And he is bringing visitor after visitor to church. This, on Sunday morning, I went over here, and there was two brand new visitors and about five other people standing around this one man who got saved. And you know this guy, once he found out who Jesus was, he said, hey, that guy you're looking for, hey, it's Jesus. He was glad. He didn't know they were going to get all upset with him. But he said, hey, I'll tell you who helped me. Jesus helped him. And people who get saved are often very excited about getting other people to the gospel of Christ. I have seen it so many times. I have a, have a friend of mine who got saved, and, and they become a catalyst. I think I told you about my friend Les. He got saved. In one year, he brought 187 people to church with him. In one year's time. He goes, you know, I don't want to go to heaven by myself. Why should I go to church by myself? So he took out his 1970 uh, Ford Maverick, and he went out and picked up people and, and uh, put, them in, put them in. He said, hey, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, and let's go to church. Okay, oh, okay, you know, and they'd come with him. He'd sit there. Some folks, they wouldn't stay for the whole service. They'd walk out. But 187 people in one year's time because they're oftentimes very bold and ready to witness. Our job is to be faithful about soul winning. So a few thoughts there. I hope that God will use them in our hearts tonight. If you came, if you came tonight, you said, Pastor, that's fine, but I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Listen, don't leave without letting someone explain that. Don't, you, you can leave this building without Jesus, but don't leave life without Him. And I'd rather you not leave the building without Him. Just come and let us talk to you. There'll be an assistant pastor at every door. Be able to share the gospel of Christ with you. Or I'll be in the foyer. would love to talk to you about that as well. One thing as we dismiss tonight, and Brother Eddie's going to come give a few things. The 2014 Voter's Guide is supplied by uh, Brother Eric Miller and, and Advance America. And these do not tell you who to vote for, who not to vote for, but they, for, but they do tell you what the voting records and what people say they believe about certain issues, which I think will help you when you go to the polls. And you are going to the polls, right? Because you are godly Christians and you want to be good citizens. And good, good Christians ought to vote and participate in that as America. Let's stand together, if you would please. Let's do a few announcements if we can. Don't forget, tomorrow is Grandparents' Day at the Hammond Baptist Schools. And uh, tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in First Baptist Church members who are grandparents or of a grandparent age are invited to attend. And you're able to visit the classrooms and attend special chapels tomorrow between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Then um, parents of teenagers, listen carefully. Last week's um, pumpkin patch activity for the high school and junior hires has been rescheduled because of rain last week. Junior high activity will leave from Hammond Baptist tomorrow at 3.15, and the high school activity will be on fr- Friday at 4.30. So don't forget that. If you have any questions, there'll be someone at guest services to help you with that. 
And then we're asking all First Baptist Church members who are current or prior military uh, can help us on Veterans Day, uh, our service, by submitting a picture of yourself while you're in the military, as well as a current picture, kind of a before and after thing, all right? When you could fit in the uniform and now that you can't. Um, this will be part of a uh, video presentation, so we'd like to have your help with that if you can. And you can email that to George Ramped at Ramped, R A N F T, at G, G for, I'm sorry, at FBCHammond.com. And, or you can see me after the service or see Brother George, and we'll get that from you, all right? So don't forget that. All right, thank you. Roy Moffat Jr. is 46 years old today. That guy right there. Right back here. Brother Roy, raise your hand there. I would ask you to stand up, but you won't get a bit taller if you do that. But can we sing happy birthday to Roy Moffat? There we go. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. You're dismissed.